Okay. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's time to start the day. Good morning. We're going to begin with scripture, right? Because that's what we always start with. I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, there are people in this room that are roughly the same age as me. And so they grew up in a time when we always heard this, okay, that your relationship with Christ is personal. It's not about everybody else, and it's not about going to church. It's about you and your walk with the Lord, right? That is not true, okay? Your relationship with Jesus is personal. You have to have one in order for you to be saved. But the gathering of the body and everybody that's in this room today has a purpose for being here. And it's teaching and admonishing one another in hymn songs and spiritual songs. What we sing is so important because whoever gets up here and preaches after me, that's important stuff. But unfortunately for him, you're going to walk away remembering what we sang. <laughs> and you're going to sing that song the rest of the day, the rest of the week. And, and what we sing with one another honors the Lord and it teaches us about him. And, uh, and so it's important that you join in. Because there's somebody in here that doesn't want to be in here. They don't feel like singing. And uh, you singing with all your heart is going to encourage them. And it might just pull them right in uh, into uh, meeting with the Lord and Him softening their heart. And so we're going to begin uh, again with some time. And just remember why you're here. We're going to begin with a song called Here For You. Uh, because we're not just here um, to sing and to uh hear the word but we're here to meet with the lord we're here for him and we're here to encourage one another so spend some time with the lord uh pray uh for those that are seated around you and their heart and then pray for your own heart and uh and then we'll begin to sing <laughs> Lord, you are here with us. It is raining. It is cool. Um, maybe we're tired. Maybe we're a lot of things that just are not ready uh, to sing and have joy in our heart. Um, and maybe we're tired already of being right up next to all the people that are here. I don't, I'm not sure where each person's at, but... You're here, and uh, we are to sing with joy, um, an everlasting joy that triumphs our circumstances. And uh, may we remember that our hearts are open and nothing is hidden in your sight. I pray for each person in here that whatever it is that they have held in their heart, um, that they would lay it before you. And we look forward to hearing the teaching and the preaching of the word. And may it dwell in us richly so we can build each other up as we continue on through the week. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Let us stand and begin to sing. Yeah. 
fire fall down Then I shout Be your anthem Your renown Fill the skies We are here for you We are here for you Now 
we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. bit more scripture before this next song. Romans 6, I'm going to begin actually reading uh, in verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When I was growing up, I was always told, read Romans 6, 23. You want salvation, you want that free gift, and then once you have it, then you just move on with life because you got your salvation, and it was free, and you didn't have to do anything to earn it. But we can't earn our salvation, but it's given to us along with the Holy Spirit, because without the Holy Spirit, we cannot be sanctified. We don't become like Christ. And so there's a reason that you're given that free gift and the Holy Spirit. It's because everything you've done in your life up till then, in God's mercy, he gives you the power to be free from it, because it gives you no fruit, only shame. And so we're going to sing a song called His Mercy is More, uh, because maybe this morning you're still full of shame of things that you've done, but his mercy is so much more than all the sins uh, that we have ever committed, and we can be thankful for that. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more.
of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the seated. Jim told me. Hello, Jim, Jim, are we live? Hello? I usually don't need it, so are we good now? Yeah. All right. Uh, I was told I'm not allowed to have a script anymore. Jim yelled at me, so if I say something offensive, it's Jim's fault. Um, <laughs> I also can't sit still, so it's hard for me. Um, so I would like to uh, bring our tithes and offerings up, and I'd like Kyle and Aaron to come up and... Uh, do this. Also, afterwards, um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. This guy always volunteers to pray. He's been such a help around camp. Kyle is going to preach the sermon today. <laughs> there it is. Aaron? Uh, no, Kyle, you should open us in prayer today. Please. So in all seriousness, um, Josh called me, um, and he's like, just found out my flight has like a layover in London. He goes, I'm not going to make it back for Sunday to be able to preach. And he's like, I've got someone in mind for the evening speaker position. He's like, it's for, to cover me for Sunday. And I was like, well, we've got two services on Sunday. We've got to find someone else. And so... Um, Every time I ask this person to do anything, they tell me no. Um, and then they, <laughs> then they say they'll think about it. Um, what's awesome is most of us have known him since he was little. Um, if you just met him this week, you've known him since he was little. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, Aaron actually very graciously was like, yeah, let me talk to Josh. Let me think about it. 
um, pray on it, and he agreed to come up and preach. I've heard him preach at the Red Door before. I think he does a fantastic job. He says he gets really nervous, but you won't be able to tell because he's, I think he's fantastic. He's got a gift, and I'm really excited that Aaron is going to come up and preach for us this morning. So now that I've been introduced, you all know my name. I'm Aaron. Grew up going to camp here, and somebody who was out of their mind decided that I should be the speaker this morning. I don't know why they thought that, but it came to their mind, so if you have complaints, take them to Joe. It's his fault. Blame him. Um, it's all just all on him. He did tell me, though, that he would be fielding all of your complaints through his wife, Cheyenne, so take them to Cheyenne, and then she'll bring them to Joe, so that's, yeah, that's, do that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm technically the first speaker for camp. And uh, so that means you gotta gotta set the tone for the week. And I was like, well, how do I, how, sh- how should I do that? So I figured I should probably talk about God. That's probably a good place to start. And uh, I wasn't really sure how to do that. And I was like, hmm. And I heard that about this book. It starts with a B. It's got a bunch of like little books in it. I think it's called the Bible. And uh, so I thought I'd I'd go in that. So I just I just dropped it open to a random page. And that's where we're going to be. So if you'll open to Table of Contents, that's where, where I'll be speaking out of this morning. And, um, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, we'll actually be in Ephesians in chapter 4. So if you want to turn there while I uh, pray and ask for some grace. <sighs> Father God, I uh, thank you for another day. I thank you for this uh, week that you've given us to come and um, seek after you. God, I pray that you would um, speak through me today and that I would not be communicating what I think, but that I would communicate what your word says, um, that I'll only speak your truth, um, and that I would do so clearly, and um, that all here would um, be blessed through it. Pray this in your name. Amen. All right. So, uh, yeah. So I've titled this sermon, Imitate God. That's, if you're taking notes, you can write a title down. Uh, so I went to, um, actually, you know what, let me, before we do that, let me just read through the whole passage first. That's, that's how I'd like to do this instead. Change my mind. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17, and we'll end in 5-2. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you've learned about Jesus Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. There you go. That's, that's your text. Um, so uh, when I left high school, I went to um, the Word of Life Bible Institute for two years to learn about the Word of God. And uh, when I left, I needed a job, as many people do when you enter the world. It's got bills to pay, car payment, insurance, rent to mom, standard stuff. And uh, so, but I went to Bible school, so I didn't leave with, 
like workplace skills. You know what I'm saying? I didn't leave with a trade or anything like that. So I went to a man I know who's currently my boss. I asked him for a job. And he said yes. And my starting pay was not great, um, but I had a job. And the reason I was getting paid so little is because he had to teach me all the skills that I needed to have to do this job. Because um, I didn't know anything. <laughs> so I've now worked for this company for three years. Or this is my third year. Sorry, let me clarify that. And I do things a certain way because it's how I was trained. I was trained to do things the way my boss does them because he knows what he's doing and I didn't. Without his instruction, I'd be going around the job site, doing everything wrong, and uh, but because he knows what he's doing and he's taught me, I now do things correctly most of the time. Well, let's be honest, there's still mistakes, but we won't talk about those. Uh, <laughs> um, but the principle of being taught and doing what you're taught applies to all of us. We all do certain things in specific ways because that's how we were shown to do those things, such as putting a new toilet paper roll on the dispenser. You know, the classic debate, does it spool towards the wall or away from it? If you spool it towards the wall, you're out of your mind, all right? Just to clarify, you're wrong. So if you learn nothing else from me, learn that. It spools away from the wall. Anyway. <laughs> Just like how I'm taught by my boss how to do things, God tells us what to do and how to do it. And what does he tell us to do? Well, if you'll go to the end of our passage, chapter 5, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Well, it's pretty straightforward. It tells us to imitate him. Right? And this is not a one-time thing. This is consistent throughout the whole Bible, God telling us to imitate him. Leviticus 19, Sue says, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. 1 Peter 1, 16, It is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And then today's passage. But these are, you know, four examples of the, you know, who knows how many that are in the Bible, calling us to be like God and to try to imitate him. Well, how do we do that? <laughs> so, in 5.1, it says, imitate God, therefore. And I'm sure we've all heard the phrase, when you see that, you gotta ask, what's the therefore, therefore? So that makes you have to go back. So you go back to the beginning of our passage now, so verse 17, and we'll now read through 17 through 19. The Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. So, basically, don't behave like you used to. Um, when you were, Gentiles also just means non-believers. When you weren't in Christ. Live no longer as the Gentiles do. It's implying that it's possible to be a Christian and to be living as a non-believer, which is not good because that's not what you're called to. Right? If you're living as a non-believer, you will be confused. And the confused in this passage is talking about God and good and evil and righteousness versus unrighteousness and doing right versus wrong. If you're confused about these things, how can you know that what you're imitating, because we're all imitating something, how can you know that you're imitating God? If you're filling your mind with the darkness of the world by living as a Gentile, these other things in these two verses, three verses, will flow out of that. So you're called to stop sinning. That's what this first part says. Now I know we're all thinking, stop sinning. I'd love to, God. It's, that's great. But, uh, but how do I do that? Well, don't worry. Boss man tells us. Before he tells us, Paul gets really specific with the who, 
no, not the band for all you previous generations, not the band, no. With the who of who's reading this passage, right? Verses 20 and 21 say, but that isn't what you learned about Christ, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him. So clearly he's speaking to Christians here. And Paul gets specific about this because if he doesn't, someone might read this and think that by doing the things in verses 25 through 32, they can get to heaven. It would be confusing because you could fall into the trap of thinking you can get saved and make it to heaven through works, which isn't true. Only Jesus can get you to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians, as I read like five minutes ago, says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And since Paul's imitating Christ, he can't say any differently from Christ, so he has to specify, lest anyone be confused by his words, and they be misconstrued, and people be led astray, giving non-believers false hope and leading believers into lives that are wrong. He doesn't want those things to happen, so he specifies. Now, for those of us who are in Christ, Paul tells us what to do in verses 22 through 24. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. The Spirit here in these statements is doing the work, not you. You don't sanctify yourself. The Spirit does. However, he needs something to do it with, something to renew you with. It's like hiring a carpenter to come fix up your house or to put siding on your cabin. <laughs> the carpenter's going to bring his tools to do the work, but he needs supplies to work with. You can tell him what you want fixed all day long, but if you don't get him anything to work with, how is he supposed to fix what you've asked him to? You're the house, and the spirit is the carpenter. And you can ask the spirit to renew your mind, but if he has nothing to renew it with, how is he supposed to do it? Just like a carpenter needs wood, the spirit needs the word. It's what he renews your mind with. This is key to this entire passage. It's, it's not just key, it's the key to this whole passage. Because if your mind isn't being renewed by the word, by the power of the spirit, then you won't do what verses 25 through 32 tell you to. Because those verses talk about implementing righteous living and like behaving righteously. But if you're not living in the spirit and having your mind renewed by the spirit, you won't have a desire to live righteously. You will have a desire to live as the world does. So that's the key to this. This is 25 through 32. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, you use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Like I said, this passage is about enacting righteous behavior. But it's not just doing righteous behavior. It's about replacing worldly behavior with righteous behavior. All these examples go from good to bad. And if we're honest, it'd be kind of weird if they didn't. Um, what he's saying here is do the opposite of what the world does. Some are kind of obvious. Don't lie. Well, what's the opposite of telling a lie? It would be telling the truth. Well, there's, there's a little bit more nuance to them. Don't steal. Instead, work hard for what you earn. And then give generously. See how working hard isn't the opposite of stealing, but giving is? So you need to remove the sin from your life by doing the opposite. right? Removing the sin is only half the battle. 
We then must replace the sin with righteous living. Sin's like an invasive plant. You can clear it away, but if you don't plant something else to fend it off, it has a far greater chance of returning and taking over that land. Sin likewise needs to be removed and then replaced with righteous behavior. So to summarize, as Christians, we're called to be imitators of God. And God doesn't sin, so we should seek not to sin. We remove sin from our lives by replacing it with righteous behavior. And our desire for righteous behavior comes from the Spirit. So we need to be strengthening the Spirit by being in the Word and giving Him what He needs to strengthen us. It's part of why we like camp so much. We feel so close to God while we're here because we're constantly feeding the Spirit all week and growing closer. But the problem is that this isn't what life is like. This is the mountaintop, which is a great place to come to and be strengthened in, but you can't stay here, and you're not supposed to stay here. We're called to go and share with the world, so you can't stay on the mountaintop and do that. I've heard a saying many times. It says, mountaintop experiences are great, but life is lived in the valley. Everyday life is in the valley. It's much harder to pursue the Lord when we're in the valley versus when we're at camp. And if you want your daily walk with the Lord to feel closer, you need to be feeding the Spirit so that you can go and share the word with others and tell others about Jesus. Camp won't sustain your spiritual life throughout the year. It just won't. It's not enough. And Sunday service won't sustain your spiritual life throughout the week. Only God can sustain you and give you, what you, give you a desire for righteousness. And he does that with his word, which is the Bible. So while you're here this week, make a plan on how you're going to get yourself in the word. When are you going to be in the word? How are you going to keep yourself in the word? Do you need help picking a place in the word or, or maybe help with understanding it because the Bible is complex? Get a devotional. It doesn't matter what your plan is. Just have a plan because if you don't, you won't be in the word when you leave camp. And if you aren't in the word, you won't be feeding the spirit. If you aren't feeding the spirit, you won't be seeking righteousness. If you aren't seeking righteousness, then you won't be imitating God, which is what we're called to do. We're called to be imitators of God. That's what I have for you today. We always do simple invitations where I come from because we wholeheartedly believe that if the power of the Spirit through the preaching of the Word does not move you, then singing for 15 extra minutes isn't going to do it either. You have heard it preached. You have heard what to do. So we will sing through a few choruses of His Mercy is More. Uh, because his mercy and his grace are sufficient uh, for what you need to respond uh, and, and move forward. He has given you what it says, what to do with it, and, and a good starting point. Um, so we're going to sing through this a couple of times together while you meditate on it. And if you need to come up front and leave something behind uh, to move forward, you can do that. And uh, we'll just sing through a couple of times. and. And then we'll move on with our day. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more stronger than darkness. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our 
Lord, we are thankful. Not just that you save us. You don't save us to set us apart and then leave us alone. You fill us with your spirit so we can be guided every step of the way. If only we would use your word um, as, as it's meant to be, which is to, to guide us step by step and to point us towards you. And then you give us the power uh, to stay in it and stay on the path. And uh, we're so thankful that you, uh, you initiate every part of this relationship that we need. And uh, without it, we wouldn't chase after you at all or even know you at all. And we are just thankful for your love, your grace, your sufficiency, and your spirit. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.